service to hamper his own service to Krishna, his own service in Krishna consciousness. However, for the service of the Lord, he can he can participate in any kind of action without being disturbed by the duality of the material world. The duality of the material world is felt in terms of heat and cold, or misery and happiness. A Krishna conscious person is above duality because he does not hesitate to act in any way for the satisfaction of Krishna. Therefore, he is steady both in success and in failure. These signs are visible when one is fully in transcendental knowledge. We should not 
lie and cheat. We should be straightforward in our dealings and be satisfied with the results of our work. Satisfied, being satisfied is one of the qualities in the mode of goodness. We, Prabhupada, well, Bhagavad Gita always encourages that we should come to the mode of goodness. Because if we're not in the mode of goodness, then we're in the mode of passion and ignorance. Tamas and drajas. And these modes of nature are very bad for us. The more we associate with the passion, then the passion will degrade to ignorance. And that's very bad, very inauspicious. Passion people use this for passion a lot. They think it's something good. I, I was com coming here and I saw this sign and they're talking about coffee. It said, brood, brood passionately. <laughs> but they use this word passion a lot. Feel the passion, taste the passion. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes the result of passion is distress. So we should be very cautious about cultivating the mode of passion because it often ends in distress. What we want to do is elevate ourselves from passion to goodness. And to come up to that level of goodness, we have to develop these qualities which are described here. Just like it mentions, being satisfied with whatever is provided for us by the grace of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna uh, was, uh, he, he, Lord Krishna met a Brahmana when Lord Krishna was residing in Dwarka, Rukmini had sent a Brahmana to Dwarka to deliver a letter to Lord Krishna. Rukmini was worried because her brother was preparing for her marriage to Sishupa. But Rukmini wanted to marry Lord Krishna. Although she never met, the two of them had never met, but Rukmini had it in her heart that she wanted Krishna for her husband. So she wrote a letter to Lord Krishna and she sent a Brahmana to Dwarka to give the letter to Krishna. So when the Brahmana came there to Dwarka, Lord Krishna was not too much worried about the letter, but he immediately started to question the Brahmana. And he wanted to know from the Brahmana are you satisfied performing your duty? Because if you're not satisfied, then you cannot be in the mode of goodness. You cannot fulfill the duties of the Brahmana. So Lord Krishna was very concerned. Brahmanas are very dear to Krishna, right? We say Namo Brahmana Devaya, Go Brahmana. Cows and the Brahmanas are both very dear to Krishna. And so Krishna is always concerned to see that the Brahmanas are keeping up their qualification as Brahmanas. That they're situated in the mode of goodness. And part of being in the mode of goodness is that you should be satisfied. Material life material world, people don't think in that way. We're always thinking, I want more. And we're very ambitious. And we're encouraged to have a lot of drive and go forward and push you, you know, go, go to the top. And, you know, and that, that mode, that passionate mode to always increase and expand and get more that is not the mode of, that's not the mode of goodness. But 
what is being described here, the more goodness, which is in line with transcendental knowledge. Cultivating transcendental knowledge should detach us from the material energy, and we should be less worried about the material things. Prabhupada mentioned in the purport how one who is in transcendental knowledge, he doesn't worry even very much about his own body. He can live with him without caring too much about his own body. Of course, it's a very advanced stage in spiritual realization. We can't imitate this, but we should know what is the, the higher stage of Krishna. And we see examples, we see examples like uh, Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami, he's Abadut. Abadut, he's totally detached from the body. He's so detached that he goes around naked. He doesn't even cover his body. But at the same time, he's the most elevated transcendentalist. Then you have other examples like there's in the 11th canto tells about the Brahmana from Avanti Desh. And it tells about how this one Brahmana, he was very rich. But when he was very rich, he was very miserly. He wouldn't even give money to his own family members, wouldn't give his wife any money didn't give any money for his servants or anything. And then by the, somehow by the arrangement of the Supreme Lord, he lost all of his money. And when he lost all of his money, then everyone deserted him. Everyone left him. His family left him. His servants left him. He was all on his own. So what to do? So he decided he would renounce the world. And he renounced the world and he became a mendicant. And when he went around, people would insult him because they all knew that before this person had been a rich person and he was very mean and miserly. So they didn't like him. And now he's, now he's a mendicant. And he's coming, begging. And so they, they were very nasty to him. They would spit on him. And they would take away, when he would wash his one piece of cloth, they would steal it from him. They would do everything they could to insult him and give him misery. But that Brahmana was, somehow he had acquired transcendental knowledge. And he understood that whatever's happening, it is just due to the modes of nature. And he shouldn't be worried about it. He remained steady by fixing his mind on the super soul. So that's one elevated way in which you can overcome the difficulties in life. Just tolerating the difficulties fixing the mind on the super soul. Of course, it's a very high stage of yoga, very advanced. The purpose of cultivating transcendental knowledge is to detach us from the material world. And the process of cultivating transcendental knowledge is described in this fourth chapter. In the, the famous verse, text number 34, where Lord Krishna says, just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. So this is the process of cultivating transcendental knowledge. You should approach the spiritual teacher. We want to get knowledge, we have to inquire from the spiritual teacher. And when you get that knowledge, the fruit of that knowledge 
will come in this way, that we will, we will become satisfied with whatever is our situation in the material world. We won't be so attached to having more. We won't be greedy. I want more. I have to get more. We'll, we'll, we'll just tolerate whatever Krishna gives. We're happy. We accept it. Sometimes Krishna gives and sometimes he takes. Right? Prabhupada said, God is like someone with ten arms. If he wants to give you something, he can give you so much. You only have two hands. How much can you receive? And he has ten. He can give you so much. And if he wants to take, he can take everything. So watch out, right? <laughs> How much can you hold on to? He can take everything. So like this, this is the first quality of one who is fixed in transcendental knowledge. And then, second one, uh, he is free from duality and does not envy. Free from duality. That's been mentioned very early on in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna speaks about the winter and the summer seasons, and he can compare them to happiness and to distress. All right? Matras, Parshas, Tukuntiya, Titoshna, Sukha, Dukata. Agama, Payeno, Nityas, Tams, Tatikshasva, Bharat. So, Tadiksha, tolerance, we have to develop that tolerance, very important quality for devotees. In the Shikshastika, Lord Chaitanya also speaks about tolerance. How tolerant we should be? More tolerant than the trees. Oh, very difficult. <laughs> Look at the trees, how they tolerate the heat and the cold, the wind and the rain. And people come and cut them and still they give fruit and flower. So tolerance, we have to cultivate this tolerance. One of the ornaments of the devotee. And that way we will be free from the duality. Because these dualities, that is the mind. The mind makes distinction. I like this, I don't like that. Somebody else likes what we don't like. And they don't like what we like. Everyone has their own likes and dislikes. It, it's going to be different for different people. Some people like to bathe in cold water, and other people, no, I have to have hot water to bathe. Some people have to have spicy food, and other people, no, I want plain, bland food, it shouldn't be too spicy. So everyone has their own preferences. This is a mind. We're making distinction. What is called Mano dhami, the business of the mind. E bhava, e brahma, e, e, e bhava, e brahma, e sabra. We're thinking this is good, this is bad, this is all the business of the mind. So we have to control the mind. How to control the mind? By transcendental knowledge. We all need to cultivate transcendental knowledge then we can tolerate the dualities and don't do not envy why should we envy envious we're envious of some, someone's got something more than i've got oh he's got more oh he's got such a nice wife oh he's got so nice children Oh, he's got more. Like the, we envy someone's got something better than us. But that is just only the mind. 
we are thinking these things, someone has these things, but we don't know what they had in the past, and we don't know what they'll have in the future. All of these things are temporary. They're all objects of the material world. They have a beginning, they have an end. You have the nice family, how long the family will be together. In course of time, the children will grow up, they will go away, they will have their own family, we will also get old, we will die, leave the book, we will take birth again. There is no reason to envy others. And if we have transcendental knowledge, then we will not envy others. And then, steady in both success and failure. When we, are, when we succeed in something, a devotee will think, by the mercy of Krishna, I have been successful. And when we fail, we will think also, it is the mercy of Krishna. It is the arrangement of Krishna. Sometimes we will succeed. We cannot succeed all the time. And when we fail, we should think, well, failure is the pillar of success. In the future, I will be there. Just like when we go out for book distribution, we would approach someone for a book, and nobody, oh, nobody take one. Oh, he didn't take one. We approach another person. He also didn't take it. And this way you go on, you can approach five, ten people. Nobody took a book. But you don't give up. You think somebody's going to come to take the book. You just keep going. So, success and failure, don't be worried about it. These results are arranged by Krishna. The real success is to remember Krishna. And if we don't remember Krishna, that is a failure. Don't be attached to the results. That is important. We do our best, we do what we can, and we get good results, Krishna's mercy. And if we don't get good results, then also Krishna's mercy. A devotee was distributing books one day in the airport, in USA. Not very easy. And people are not very friendly. So he offered a book to one man, and the young man just hit him. So what did the devotee do? Well, he didn't grab him and, you know, punch him back. But what he did do, he said, thank you, Krishna. And went on distributing books. So that, that is how we should act when we are based in transcendental knowledge. It's important for us to cultivate this kind of knowledge. And how do we cultivate that knowledge? By hearing. Hearing from Prabhupada. Read Prabhupada's books. And study the Bhagavad Gita. We are having so many nice courses now in Malaysia. Are any of you doing the Bhakti Shastri course? Yes? And what about the Gita Gyan course? A chapter a day, they do, they have the Gita Gyan, they go one chapter a day. And just one hour, they take one chapter, they have PowerPoint presentation. Very nice, very clear, and done by Malaysian devotees. Many of the ladies, they're teaching it. So, you should also study this Gita Gyan. And then you also teach it. And that way you learn it better. When you teach something, then you will learn it better. So we want all of you, you are the teachers. You have to become the teachers. You have to teach this Bhagavad Gita to people. 
people are in ignorance. They don't have any transcendental knowledge. They have the mundane knowledge. It's avidya. Okay? So they don't have vidya. Vidya is transcendental knowledge. So we want, don't be disturbed by success and failure. And never entangled. Such a person is never entangled. So a person is never entangled, although performing actions. Lord Krishna is speaking about this to Arjuna. Because Arjuna was worried that he is going to be entangled in sinful reactions because he's going to take part in the battle at Kurukshetra. So one of the reasons why Krishna, why Arjuna didn't want to fight, Arjuna told Krishna that it will be sinful reactions. I'm going to fight, I'm going to kill people, I'm going to do so many things, I'll get reactions for that. But Lord Krishna is explaining that if you come to this platform of transcendental knowledge, that even though you're performing actions, you don't get entangled. Entangled means you get caught up the modes of nature and our mind becomes confused, we become full of anxiety and we become very disturbed and emotional and this is all signs we've become entangled, we've become too much attached to getting results our expectations are too big we want to get more than what Krishna wants to give us. We have to learn to be situated on the platform of knowledge. That is the best platform. On the platform of knowledge, we will see the hand of Krishna in everything. We, we are always quoting Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma saying, Ishvara Parama Krishna. That Krishna is the supreme controller. And he is Sarva Karana Karana. He is the cause of all causes. So everything is the arrangement of Krishna. And we have to see that. We have to realize that. Not just know it theoretically. But we must realize it. We must be convinced that ultimately it's all Krishna's plan. We are simply the instrument in the hands of Krishna. At least we want to become an instrument in the hands of Krishna. If we are not in the hands of Krishna, then we are in the hands of man. So, it's one way or the other. Either we are with Krishna or we are with Maya. We have that choice. We have that free will. One who is in knowledge, transcendental knowledge, will take shelter of Lord Krishna. We must surrender to Krishna. Lord Krishna also describes in the Bhagavad Gita, Bahunam Yamanam Ante Yanabam Nam Prabhajante Vasudev Sarvamiti Sa Mahatma Sudurnava. Lord Krishna is describing the result of the process of knowledge. After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders to Krishna, Vasudev. Knowing that Krishna Vasudev is everything. Such a soul is real. That is the, 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 the end of knowledge. So somebody is doing Jnana Yoga, 
just like there are people, they don't have much bhakti, they don't have any real devotion, and they won't chant the Hare Krishna mantra. They just want to read the book, and they want to meditate, and they want to understand the knowledge. Gyanis, they're called gyan, or sometimes we will call them Vedantists. So their goal is knowledge. But what is the end of knowledge? Just like there's a book called Vedanta Sutra. Vedanta means the end of knowledge. Veda means knowledge and Anta is the end. So the end of knowledge. And what is the end of knowledge? What do you think? What is the end of knowledge? Krishna, right? Krishna. Krishna. It says, Veda By all the Vedas, I am to be known. I am the author. I am the compiler of the Vedas. So the whole purpose of Vedic knowledge is to understand Krishna. To come to Krishna. That is transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge begins by understanding who am I? Right? Who am who are what is our identity? We are thinking we're the body. We identify with the body. But we are not the body. We are all spiritual beings. We're spirit souls. That is the beginning of transcendental knowledge. To know that you are not the body, that you are the soul living in the body. <laughs> You're living in the body. You have to understand our spiritual identity. But that is only the beginning of transcendental knowledge. Then you have to go on and understand if I am a soul, then what is my function here? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to do something? Is there any work for me as a soul? I'm a soul. Am I not? I, I, I should do anything. And some people think, well, I'm a soul. I'm God. They're thinking, I'm God. So they don't do anything. They go away from the world or they sit and do nothing. Or they simply sit and chant, Aham Brahmasmi, Aham Brahmasmi. Sometimes people, one man told me, he said he was chanting Namo Shivaya, Om Namo Shivaya. But he said, one day I'll be chanting Aham Shivaya. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the goal. See, at the beginning, he's offering obeisances, but the goal to become. And similarly with the Buddhists, they are chanting Omitoho, Omitoho. They are chanting the Buddhist name, but their goal is to become the Buddha. And they think they're ultimately everyone is the Buddha. That is their thinking. Uh, everybody is the Buddha. They have even a Buddha world. Everyone's the Buddha. So they don't make distinction between the men and the women. In the, in the Buddha world, there's only Buddhas. There's no men, there's no women, there's only Buddha. So one, one Buddhist monk was asking me that in Krishna consciousness, are there women? Do you have women in the spiritual world? I said, oh yeah. <coughs> Very beautiful woman. <laughs> and, and he said, isn't there any problem? Said, no problem. Everyone is so pure. Everyone is so happy in Krishna. That is the result of transcendental knowledge. Because we lack transcendental knowledge, therefore there are problems in this world. And we we see wars, 
quarrel, argument, so many problems. Everyone is competing with each other, trying to enjoy sense gratification more than the other. People do not know what is real happiness. They are thinking happiness is to satisfy the body, to satisfy the senses, to satisfy the tongue, to satisfy the hand. They are thinking that is happiness. They do not know that real happiness is within, and real happiness comes from the soul, not from the body. The senses are the source of misery. We are thinking the senses are going to give us happiness, rather it's just the opposite. They give us more distress, they bring us more misery. So very important that we learn to control the senses. And how to control the senses? By chanting Hare Krishna Mantra regularly, every day. You have to make it your sadhana, your spiritual prayer. Every day you want to chant the Maha Mantra and try to read scriptures like Bhagavad Gita. Nowadays there are many lectures also online. You can be hearing different people speaking all different languages, Tamil, Telugu, Hindi, whatever language you want. Chinese, Russian is all there. You can get nice discourses with a lot of spiritual knowledge. But most important is we have to chant ourselves. Our spiritual life begins when we are chanting the holy name. So you have to make it a regular program to chant this Maha Mantra. Now the, in chanting the Maha Mantra, there are no rules about it. Any time, any place you can chant. But still, sometimes, some time in the day is better than other times. And the best time in the day is in the early morning. The early morning hours. You may say, oh no, I have to rush to Singapore early morning. So many have to rush. Well, you have to try to adjust your timetable. Try to wake up a little earlier so that you can do some chanting in the early morning. There's a day, auspicious time in the day, which is called Brahma Mohurta. And the Brahma Mohurta is a time which is very good for spiritual advancement. Prabhupada, and you see temples everywhere, they would, they, they're like that. They open very early in the morning, so early, like 4.30. Is it early? <laughs> well, even the Buddhist, a Buddhist temple, they wake up for by 4 o'clock in the morning. You'll hear the Muslim prayers, morning prayers also, 4.30 in the morning. You'll hear the, from the mosque, the reading of Quran. Because they know that auspicious time in the day, it's a good time. If you get in the habit like that, that is for the mode of goodness. Early morning is more peaceful and it's a better time in the day to do chanting. At night, after a whole day, you know, there's so many things happening, and by the evening, you cannot really focus so well on the chant. So we encourage people to try to chant in the morning. And we do have also our morning programs in the temple, where we have classes and pujas and so on. Everything is done more in the morning. 
in the evening can also be done, but it's especially powerful in the morning. So that's how we can cultivate more of the mode of goodness. You know, at night, you know, people are drunk. They, they go drinking at night, they go to clubs at night. A lot of passion, a lot of ignorance is there more in the evening and in the night. Early morning, it's a little more conducive to the mode of goodness. And it's good for our spiritual advance. So we encourage you also, you want to cultivate this transcendental knowledge. There are certain things which we have to do and things which we should avoid doing. Just like we avoid intoxication, meat eating, gambling, illicit sex, we avoid these things. But certain things which we do, like chanting and hearing and worshipping, praying, going to temple, seeing the deities, as well as honoring spiritual foodstuffs like prasad. These things are very good for our spiritual life. So I'm very, very happy to see so many of you could come here this evening. Thank you very, very, very much for giving me an opportunity to address all of you here this evening. Are there any questions? Yes, Maharaj, see, we have a chanting, no any rules and regulation. Example, like uh, we are uh, parents have passed away. Is it possible we go to sit down there and chanting? Otherwise, we are parents who have passed away. So is it possible we sit down there and chanting? Ah, yeah, because we are parents passed away. So we can chanting over there. And the graveyard. Sorry? No, the house itself. The house itself. The house itself. Actually, uh, in the morning, uh, we go and pluck flowers and during that time we pass by the garden. There are small, small insects, especially like this now is uh, rainy season. So, you got the small, small, uh, what do you call this? Uh, uh, not, uh, not the, not the snails. snails, snails. So, uh, unknowingly, uh, we step on it. But we, we will be continue chanting or we will just sing some songs while plucking. Is it beneficial to that, uh, those uh, living beings, uh, because they are uh, dying because we are stepping, but at the same time... <laughs> well, I, I don't know about that, that is beneficial to them, but uh, I don't think we get any sinful reactions for doing it. We don't do it on purpose, of course. Try not to step on these things. We do want to be careful. We know my granny hunter was going to meet the Radha Muni and he was sweeping the insects out of the way. And so if you know there are some snails and things there, be careful how you step and try to avoid them. But do, do the snails benefit because they're being killed by a devotee? Well, <laughs> We'll get a higher life form. Yeah. I don't know how much benefit we'll get, but we'll get a higher form of life. Because when the soul passes, we are still chanting. Yes. So that should... I don't know how much they're hearing, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being killed by a devotee, of course. <laughs> we certainly pray, pray for the snails. 
so that they will get a higher form of life, some contact, and can become devotees. And even they also have this uh, Ekadishi, because during Ekadishi, if they passed away, they also will be able to get liberated, uh, Maharaj. So, just because they passed away on the Ekadishi, yes. they're not devotees. Yes. They're not chanting, they're not chanting, they do not not so easy to get liberated. Just because they leave the body on ecology, it doesn't have any significance. They have they have to be observing ecology. But at least if they if they pass away in front of uh, Acharya or uh, highly liberated soul and in front of the eyes, if it is passing away, that definitely it will be beneficial. For that, those they pass people. away in front of a, a devotee and acharya. Yes. A living acharya, they yes. pass away. But that, that is very auspicious. Yes. That, because in the presence of the acharya, or in the presence of a devotee, then they will be hearing the holy name. The, the acharya will be chanting the holy name and reminding them about Krishna. But they leave the body in the presence of such a great personality. It's very good for them. Not that they'll get back to Godhead, but they'll get an, a definitely an opportunity for future life to associate with the devotees. And they take birth in a family of devotees, so they can continue. But you don't get back to Godhead. How about Maharaj? Let's say, Maharaj, let's say they have a sudden death. Sudden death, the accident like that, they die, Maharaj, like that. Let's say a devotee, but... Who? Devotee. A devotee dies suddenly. Yeah, suddenly, like an accident, so he... Well, devotee dies suddenly. The Puranas say that he may not have had the opportunity to be taken to Krishna at that moment. But in, throughout his life, he had dedicated himself to the service of Krishna. Then Krishna does not forget him. He gets the result of his work. If he had been working regularly throughout his life in the service of Lord Krishna, then certainly Krishna will take care to, do, to deliver that work. Yeah, we see some devotees, you know, living in unusual circumstances, like, uh, you know, somehow Krishna Goswami departed in a motor car accident, and then also the soul in his back, the Charu Swami departed in COVID, COVID. So, not very easy for them to be, you know, fully absorbed in Krishna. It's not like they're just sitting here. To the but because they are dedicating their life for the service of Krishna, then certainly Krishna will deliver them. Because they were so dedicated, they put everything, their whole life, so many years, fully dedicated to the service of Krishna. And so although they died in you know, unusual circumstances, Krishna would not forget them. Maharaj, one more. Uh, let's say it's a beginner, just joining. So they have an option to do the deity worship. Also, they are limited. They have a limited time. They have an option to do the deity worship. Either they have to do the chanting. Which one is uh, their their preference should be, Maharaj? Which one they have to give the first? Should do the chanting. Chanting is first. You're going to do deity worship. Okay, that's all right. But the first thing is the chanting. If you, if you think you can do deity worship and not chant, it's not good, not right. You cannot, deity worship will not have any effect without the chanting. And the chanting is what will nullify all any offenses which we need to perform, which we need to commit in the course of our deity worship. 
sometimes people think oh deity worship so important. But the first business of the Bodhi is chanting the holy name. And, and, and particularly in the Kali Yuga, there's no other way but by the holy name. So we do the chanting and then the deep. Gracias.